Thanks so much for both being here, guys. Um, firstly, why not start with you, Stephen? Um, tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, uh, where you're from, and what you do. Sure. My name is uh, Stephen Woodford. I come from the Isle of Wight, so I've got many fingers. <laughs> and um, basically, all my life, I've been interested in existential questions. I wanted to know why we're here, what's our purpose, because what could be more important, and if, if we have a life after this, then that matters probably more than our life here. And so what I've done is arguably try to pursue wherever the truth of these answers lie. And I have found that no religion holds those answers and that uh, we are simply an evolved ape. And there is, as Darwin would say, grandeur in this view of life. But it seems that a lot of people struggle to uh, see it as I do. Thank you. Sure. Um, how did you sort of get into doing what you do nowadays, you know, YouTube and stuff like that? What sort of motivated you to get involved in that? Hmm. I guess, I guess Christopher Hitchens played a role. <laughs> um, to be honest with you, looking at debates and listening to people butt heads on this topic, uh, on, on all topics to do with religion, is most certainly what got me interested in. And also just, just wanting to understand logic and reason, and philosophy and consistency. Um, because I'm so passionate about what's true and uh, how we make our way towards truth, it's just led me down this path where I'm having these conversations and, uh, and debates, uh, well, pretty much these conversations and making videos on these types of topics. Fantastic. Well, it was alright that you're here to speak with us and I'm Thank you really for looking forward me. to hearing from you. Um, Justin, tell us a bit about yourself and who you are and what you do as well. Uh, well, um, I'm Justin and I host a faith debate show that goes out on radio and podcast and also video now. So we've been mm. doing, rather like Stephen, a lot of video over the last year and a half or so. And most of the time, I'm the moderator. I'm kind of in your position, actually, having a Christian and a non-Christian join me to debate some aspect of faith or belief. Um, and that's kind of grown in popularity over the years. So we now get a lot of people listening all over the world, both Christians and non-Christians. It's called Unbelievable, with a question mark. And it's about having good conversations between people who have faith and those who don't. Um, and so that's, that's what I've been doing, yeah, for the last, uh, getting on for 14 years, believe it or not. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I love your debate show. It's brilliant. Um, what, what kind of um, keeps you interested in these conversations? Do you never find that they sort of like, you, you get the answers and you move on? And well, inevitably, of... you end up doing a lot of the same topics, but you always find a different angle on it because everyone's different and every single individual who comes on brings some kind of different element to it. What I love about what I do is I create the kind of podcast that if I wasn't creating it, I'd want to listen to. And so I have the enormous privilege of actually doing something that I really enjoy and not everyone in this world gets to do that. Um, so, so in a way, it's, I'm excited by the topics. I, you know, I get engaged intellectually and I'd say spiritually by the kinds of issues that we discuss on the programme. So for me, um, it really ticks all the boxes in that way. Sure thing. Well, brilliant. Um, thank you for both coming here. Um, can you guys hear us all right? Everything okay at the back? Super. Brilliant. Um, we're going to um, get started and now, obviously, whatever your perspective, you're so welcome to be here and really delighted that you can all be here um, to enjoy the debate with us together. Um, the first person who's going to speak is Justin, so he's going to go up to the stage. If you wouldn't mind um, applauding as he gets up, that'd be brilliant. Tell me if I put this in the right place. What will that do? Great. Okay. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for this invitation to come and speak. Thanks to Josh and the, the OIQ uh, for the invitation. It's great to be back in Oxford. Uh, I'm really looking forward to engaging with Stephen tonight. Though, as I said, I'm much more used to being the moderator uh, than one of the protagonists in the discussion. But it's, it's going to be fun. Um, I was a student actually here at Oxford uh, 20 years ago, believe it or not, probably before some of you were born, I imagine, which makes me feel incredibly ancient. Um, but... Um, it, the question under discussion is, is it rational to be a Christian? And to some extent, that involves my journey at Oxford along the way. A good place to start, though, would be to define the word rational. A simple definition might be that rational beliefs are those that are supported by good evidence. And that works for me. Uh, in some ways, tonight, I've taken the burden of proof on myself in the way the question has been worded. Is it rational to be a Christian? We might equally have asked, is it rational to be an atheist? Because at the end of the day, we all need to provide good reasons for what we believe. <laughs> Nevertheless, I don't think the burden is too heavy on me because actually I think it's possible to rationally be a Christian 
or to rationally be an atheist. People often have different but personally valid reasons for believing different things. I'm not going to declare an atheist is irrational necessarily just because they come to a different conclusion to me after looking at the evidence. So I hope that favour might be returned by Stephen tonight, we'll see. Or he might be prepared to say at the very least being a Christian is not irrational. And of course what's really at stake isn't just is it rational but is it true? Because when it comes to atheism and Christianity, obviously at least one of them must be false. Today I'm going to present what I think are objective evidences for the truth of Christianity. But as I say, I think you can rationally be a Christian even without objective evidence. Many people are Christians on the basis of some subjective experience, believing that Christ has in some way entered, shaped or changed their life. And until they're given some other compelling reason not to trust that experience, I think they're justified in holding to it. And that was me in my late teens. I had an experience of God that meant I called myself a Christian up to the point I came here to Oxford University. But of course, once I got here, I did have that belief challenged when I encountered skeptics among my friends and tutors and peers. In fact, I had quite a significant period of doubt towards the end of my first year when I genuinely questioned whether any of this was true. And it was really then that I started looking into the objective evidence for Christianity. And that continued after university as I began The Unbelievable Show. 20 years later, it's left me convinced that actually Christianity is an intellectually compelling account of reality. So I mentioned the burden of proof is on me tonight, but actually it's not always helpful to do things in isolation. I think contrast often brings clarity. So what I've learned in hosting the show is that we all do have a worldview, a way of seeing the world. And I'll be hoping to show tonight that it's more rational to be a Christian than to be an atheist. Specifically, atheist materialism is what I have in view, and I believe is the view Stephen holds, so he'll be able to tell us himself. It's the idea that ultimately, all that exists is matter and energy in motion. There's no supernatural dimension to reality. In my opinion, there are lots of aspects of reality that that kind of atheist materialism fails to ultimately explain, but which Christianity makes good sense of. Now, time's really short, so I'm going to whiz through a few of them, and I hope I don't trigger too many of Stephen's famous fallacy cards along the way. Um, firstly, I think God makes sense of human existence. Atheists often claim that science confirms atheism, but I disagree. I think lots of aspects of science point towards God. For instance, the fine-tuning of the universe for life is this extraordinary phenomenon where it seems that when the universe came into being, which is itself a pretty remarkable fact, it was birthed with an amazingly precise set of values that govern the laws of nature, and they have to be just as they are for life to develop at some point in the cosmos. For instance, if the gravitational constant differed from its actual value by one part in 10 to the 60, then stars wouldn't be able to form, which produce the specific chemicals needed for life to be possible. And that's just one of many examples, some of them far, far more unlikely. So the fact that we're here, is it just a happy accident, as many atheists claim? Well, the chances seem so extraordinarily minute, the better hypothesis is that we were meant to be here that there is, in fact, a designer behind the universe. And even the fact we can do this sort of science is because the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Now, maths is an abstract subject that we can work out in our head, yet for some bizarre reason, it happens that the entire physical universe can be mapped out and predicted using its principles. It's what the Nobel Prize winning physicist Eugene Wigner described as the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Again, is it just a happy coincidence? And again, I think luck isn't a satisfactory explanation here. It makes more sense to believe that there's a mind behind this language of the universe and ultimately behind the language of life who intends for, this, for us to be able to be here and to explore the cosmos in which we find ourselves. So I believe God makes sense of human existence. Secondly, I believe God makes sense of human value. Last year was the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I imagine that everyone in this room celebrates the values of equality, dignity, and personhood that it embodies. The question is, why? Why should we treat each other as having these intrinsic value and invi inviolable rights? I haven't found a good explanation for that on atheist materialism. If we are just one more byproduct of an unguided evolutionary process, why should we deserve special treatment? And if one culture develops a disregard for some human lives, such as parts of the world where baby girls are left to die because there is a preference for boys, well, that's just the way the world is. 
There's no ultimate right or wrong in the universe. It's ultimately just governed by the blind forces of materialism. Now, the problem here is that a scientific approach, some people try to use that to gain some kind of a moral value system, but it won't buy you a moral universe. Science is really great at describing the way things are, but it has nothing to say about the way things ought to be, and that's what morality is. But we know, don't we, that there are ways that we should treat each other as humans, that some things are objectively right and wrong, regardless of what our evolutionary history or culture happens to have delivered us. So for me, whereas atheism fails to account for this human value, Christianity has a ready explanation. In fact, from page one of the Bible, we're told that humans are made in the image of God. And not just that, that God came in the person of Jesus ultimately to die for us. And that invests humans with ultimate dignity and value. That's why I believe God makes sense of human value. Thirdly, I think God makes sense of human reason. Now, as his YouTube name, Rationality Rules, suggests, Stephen is a committed defender of reason. But atheist materialism fundamentally undermines the very rationality that Stephen says rules. Why? Well, Stephen is an atheist materialist, as I said, and therefore, quite rightly, a determinist. He believes there's no such thing as free will. We live in a closed system, a universe of purely material cause and effect. What that means is you had no choice of being here. You had no choice in the clothes you're wearing or the millions of large or tiny decisions that you make every day. In the end, it's just about atoms and electrons doing their thing. There's actually not even a you to speak of, just a collection of utterly predetermined processes going on in your brain. Determinism also means that if you're a Christian here tonight, you didn't choose to be. And if you're an atheist, you didn't choose to be. The universe chose it for you. One brain happens to fizz in one way that makes them an atheist, and another brain happens to fizz in another way that makes them a Christian. And in the end, there's nothing true or false about the activity of electrons in our brains. But you might be starting to see the problem now. You see, if we never choose our beliefs, but they're handed to us by a non-rational, determined process, then we haven't actually arrived at them through a process of reasoning. That's why atheistic determinism fundamentally undermines the concept of reason to begin with. That means that Stephen and his fellow atheists have effectively sawn off the branch that they're sitting on. For us to have any confidence in deterministic materialism, we have to believe we've got good reasons for it. But if we had no choice about coming to those beliefs, then we've no reason to say they're good. It's utterly self-defeating. Now, the only way out of this pickle is if there is some kind of guarantor of reason. And I believe God is that guarantor. If there's a God, then we aren't in this closed system. Our sense that we are actually free and that we can use reason to arrive at our beliefs, well, that makes sense if God creates us with genuine freedom to choose. That's why I believe God makes sense of human reason, whereas atheist materialism doesn't. You could even say that God makes the rules of rationality. Mm. That one was for you, Steve. <laughs> um, finally, um, look, I kind of made a case for God here, but what about the Christian one? Is there a way of knowing which God? I think we already have some clues to this along the way, but the point is, it's at this point really that we come to the person of Jesus. If the central claim at the heart of Christian faith is that Jesus died and rose again, well, if that's true, then we have a good reason for believing his claim that he was God. I believe that just as it's rational to believe that there's a God behind the universe, it's also rational to believe that that God raised Jesus from the dead. Why? Well, very briefly, there are good historical reasons to believe what the first followers of Jesus said about him was true. You don't have to accept the Bible as divinely inspired to be able to appreciate them as historical documents, especially the New Testament. And across the vast majority of New Testament historians, both believing and non-believing, there's a wide consensus on several facts. Here's, here's a few of them. Firstly, that Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Secondly, that his tomb was discovered empty by a group of his female followers. Third, that his followers had experiences that they believed were of the risen Christ. Fourth, that against the odds, skeptics who were opposed to Christianity were converted, such as Paul and James, the brother of Jesus. And fifth, that the explosive growth of the early Christian church and transformation of defeated followers into a group of people willing to be persecuted and die for their belief in a resurrected Messiah. Well, we've got to ask, where did that come from as well? 
And despite the various alternative hypotheses that have been given, I think the most reasonable conclusion to draw from these historical facts is the one that the first followers gave, that Jesus had indeed been raised from the dead. There's a resurrection-shaped hole, if you like, at the birth of Christianity. So in my very short time, what I've sketched out here amounts to a cumulative case for Christianity and why I do think it's perfectly rational to be a Christian. Indeed, I'd argue it's more rational to be a Christian than to be an atheist. Of course, as I hinted earlier, faith in God isn't simply an intellectual thing. I believe that Christianity makes sense of us emotionally too, as humans, and perhaps a bit later on uh, in my final words, I'll have a chance to talk about that. But for now, I hope that's given us something to talk about when we get into our conversation, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Stephen has to say. Thank you. very much. So <clears throat> we're here to discuss whether or, not uh, whether or not Christianity is rational and half of Justin's speech was to criticize a view that I don't have, which is a good start. Um, good sir, I shall give you a free copy of Debunked after the evening. <laughs> okay, so rationality is the quality or state of being rational, that is being based on or agreeable to reason. And Christianity, my fellow apes, is not that. I'll delve into the reason shortly, but first, a few formalities. Uh, Josh, thank you very much for arranging this debate. Uh, these things are not easy to establish, but you've done a mighty fine job. Thanks. Uh, secondly, thank you, Justin, for accepting the challenge. Um, for what it's worth, you are perhaps my favorite Christian. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a lot of respect for you. I think you're a wonderful person. But... <laughs> With that said, I'm going to be particularly barbed towards you this evening because this is a motion that we are both very passionate about and we owe it to the audience not to mince our words. And talking of which, thank you all ever, ever so much for being here. You could be anywhere else. It's a Friday evening. Uh, you could be partying, playing boggle or uh, praying or whatever it is that you find people do. But uh, no, you've chosen to be here exercising faith that me and Justin will put on a good show. To begin, I'd like to make a request of the audience. Please put your hand up if you identify as, or consider yourself to be, Christian. Well, I know these two, but... <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, Josh, I may need to have a word with you about adequate representation. <laughs> now, I'm joking, of course. I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. This is the lion's den, as it were. And rationally, I'm going to poke you, because don't spoil the rod. Uh, but with that said, know that despite appearances, I'm not your enemy. Just like you, I want to know the truth of existential questions. I earnestly crave to understand the world around me. But unlike you, I've concluded that Christianity is not only irrational, it's poison. So on that light note, <laughs> next question. If you could please raise your hands again if you're Christian and keep them raised if you believe that life starts at conception. I'm not doing this to judge you, I'm just trying to find out a thing here. Okay, cool. Now, it's an interesting split, and considering that you all have access to the same divine book, and yet you have a staggeringly different views, does this mean that a portion of you have irrational beliefs? If so, don't worry, it's them, not you. What about gay marriage? Please put your hand up if you're for it. If you think that homosexuals should be allowed to marry, please put your hand up. Again, there's a split. And again, what does this mean in terms of rationality? You all have the same divine message, and yet you have staggeringly different views. Remember, this is divine revelation we're speaking about. This isn't some assertion that's been made at the pub. This is coming from an all-powerful, almighty God. You would think it would be a little clearer. Right, last one. Please put your hands up if you accept evolution by natural selection. I'll be honest, that is more than I expected. Progress. Okay, but there is another split. And that is predictably irrational. You'd have thought that Genesis would have made us all convinced that man was created by God. And indeed, most Christians throughout history have believed exactly that. In fact, there was a time where people like me would have been executed because I don't hold that view. But over the last few hundred years, scientific discoveries, that is, overwhelming evidence, has dragged Christianity into the 21st century kicking and screaming. And now it has the audacity to pretend that it's wanted to be here all along. Now, to the topic at hand, is Christianity rational? 
The answer is that it depends on the definition and use and the specific theological claims made, as indeed was uh, lightly covered by Justin. On the one hand, if you lower your standards of evidence to make uh, belief in Christianity rational, you simultaneously make mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive religions also rational, which is irrational, assuming that you accept the law of non-contradiction, which you do, or very likely, I should say. It is, one might say, a pyrrhic victory, uh, a battle won, but at the cost of the war. Alternatively, if you exercise a healthy standard of evidence, as you do in your daily life on pretty much every other topic, you are left with no religion being rational. And finally, if you exercise low standards of evidence to justify Christianity, and a healthy standard of evidence to justify everything else, then you are committing a special pleading fallacy, and thus are being irrational. These avenues and many more, I'm sure that me and Justin will unpack over the next hour. But to spend the, uh, what I'd like to do with the rest of my time here is get straight to the root. According to Christianity, uh, sorry, according to the Christian worldview, that is, according to the worldview of Justin and most of you here, there is a God. And this God has the most profound, important message for you and I. So profound, in fact, that there has never been a message that's been more important and there likely never will be. What's more, this God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere at once, and all-loving. That is, he's omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipresent um, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. What this means is that this, this God can, could, by definition, click his fingers, and instantly we'd all receive this most important message, and it would, by definition, be tailored in such a way that we would all accept it in its entirety. We would all be Christian. And better still, we would be, all be of the exact same sect. There would be no atheists, no Muslims, no Hindus, and no Buddhists, because in this case, God really would have written it on our hearts. Furthermore, we'd all share the exact same view on extremely important topics, such as abortion, gay rights, and evolution. Put simply, an all-powerful Christian God would be able to instantly convince us all of Christianity, and if it was also all-loving, it already would have done so. However, this God, with its divine intelligence, chose to convey this most important message, and with it the balance of eternal pleasure and eternal suffering, to a small group of people in a breathtakingly illogical, irrational way. And now, 2,000 years on, you and I have to rely on copies of copies of translations of translations of amendments of amendments written by anonymous authors with contradicting accounts and whose accounts have suspiciously uh, suspicious similarities with other religious myths. And yet, this all-powerful, all-loving God expects us to accept this abysmal evidence as if it's sufficient. And if we don't, this God will strike down upon thee with great vengeance and furious anger. Ask yourself, with all sincerity, how is that rational? Even if you strip back, if you, even if you strip back my hyperbole and bend as far backwards as you possibly can, can you really rationalise such absurdity? Would you accept such malformed logic in any other domain of discourse? A personal friend of mine, and indeed a hero, Matt Dillahunty, has said that for him, the aforementioned observation is the nail in the coffin for Christianity. And I agree with him, though I believe it to be more accurate to say that it's the final nail on the cross. An omniscient, uh, sorry, an omniscient God would clearly know that such evidence is not nearly sufficient and an omnibenevolent God would find it morally repugnant to demand that we accept the unacceptable for, uh, under threat of anything. Therefore, only an impotent or evil being would conjure such an irrational set of circumstances. But to be more forthright, if I possibly can, <laughs> let me put it this way. If you believe in an omnipotent, omnibenevolent God that wishes to convey a message convincingly, and you are earnestly convinced that anecdotal, contradictory, anonymous translations of translations, of copies of copies, of amendments of amendments, of accounts of reality being suspended in a way never seen before or after, I fear that I can't help you, and neither can Jesus. Thank you for your time. I look forward to the exchange that's about to occur. I'm sure we'll all enjoy it. Thank you. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter. Um, we're going to go straight into our conversation time now. Um, to be a little bit late, I want us to leave time for questions at the end.
I was going to add to um, probably if you uh, stop the session and have a direct on it, like that, it and then it out by anyway, we'll get to what we can get to. Um, so thank you first of all, Stephen, and uh, myself as well for a uh, uh, great presentation. Um, I will let you ask me the questions that you have had obviously the objections. I'll, I'll use my time to, to kind of press some of my points. The first thing is you obviously said I, I hadn't represented you, and if I have, I apologise, but what do you believe, just so you can hear? Sure, so you're contrasting, say, atheism with Christianity. So that is a <coughs> black and white fallacy. You're saying here are two worldviews. Mm -hmm. If one is eliminated, the other one, that one must be right. Um, I wouldn't say I'm saying that exactly. I'm saying that it, it helps to see the problems with atheist materialism. Mm -hmm. And I think they do ultimately reflect back to the fact that the theistic is more probable. Now, I'm not saying there couldn't be other possible options, but I do think it makes theism a lot more probable. Um, materialism, just so I understand. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, kind of the def definition I tried to give there, which is essentially that all that ultimately exists is matter in motion, energy that there's ultimately nothing beyond the purely material. So I don't claim to know that. Okay. Yeah. But I'm guessing you, are you simply agnostic? Or do you think there might be a God I, I, after I, all? Uh, what, so, what? so strictly speaking, I have to be, from the deist position, which mm -hmm. is that there is a God that exists, mm. um, say the Greek gods, for example, yeah, I have to be um, agnostic to it. But I am agnostic to it in the same way that I'm agnostic to many other things. Uh, the famous case being uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, Celestial Teapot. Okay. Well, um, in, in, in that sense, we're all to some extent agnostic, you know. Yes. Um, but would you be willing to give any kind of probability that the materialist account is the correct account? So everything that I've observed, mm -hmm. everything that I've been exposed to, my, my honest discourse uh, in trying to pursue these questions has just so, shown no sign that we're special, okay. despite the fact that psychologically we really want to be. So, no, I just don't see any sign off it. So, and, would, uh, so well, what I'm asking is, would does, say, is it likely then for you that the materialist account is true? Yeah, so what I would say with that is I don't, so um, it's like laws of logic in, in, in a yeah. similar sense. So far as my experience shows, so far as our scientific verifiable evidence shows, um, all we have is things that fit into the material out there, but that doesn't mean that I assert that everything oh, sure. is sure, I accept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not going to say it's 100%, yeah. but you might say it's, I don't know, 90%, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, okay, all, I'm, sure. all I'm trying to do is to say um, it's useful when you're presenting a case to know sort of what it is you're presenting against. Otherwise, it literally is all the burden of proof is on me and you can just say, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Sure. I don't think that's quite fair. I think it's, yeah. it's fair to have two different perspectives and to say which makes best sense. And perhaps that was my fault in agreeing to a, a talk which was inevitably one-sided in terms of the way it was, it was um, presented. But um, the, the, my second question I'd love to get to is, did you choose to be here? Oh, so you're coming down to the free will situation? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. Um, in, a, in, in, a, in a colloquial sense, yes. Okay. What sense didn't you? Um, if you verify the evidence, mm -hmm. what it shows is that freedom as we conceive it is an illusion. It's a mm -hmm. bit like when you look at, um, if you print out an optical illusion and you look at it and see it, you see it moving, you do see it moving and really that's what matters, but it's not moving. That is essentially how um, my view is on free will. So ultimately, so, yeah, in that sense, no, I didn't choose to be. Okay. And um, did you choose to be an atheist in that sense? No. no. I, so, I also reject the idea of um, being able to choose your beliefs anyway. I don't think okay. you could choose. So if you can't choose your beliefs, if you can't choose to follow the evidence where mm -hmm. it goes and that sort of thing, if ultimately we all were bound to believe what we believe, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, the circumstances, that we, uh, you wound the clock back, we would all be in exactly the same position. Um, in what sense are your beliefs rationally justified? Because you do claim to be rationality rules, but I can't see how they're rational if you didn't choose them. Um, I'm curious of what definition of rationality you're using then. Because well, simply, uh, do, well, you mean, my, do you mean truth? Or yeah, whether, true, true? whether they're true on the basis of having examined the evidence. So, so true is not the same as rational. Um, but you ask, do you want well, to ask well, I'm saying, or the truth? I think that the rationality is about coming to what we believe is the closest thing to truth based on the evidence that we see. So, so, so I would say that rationality is having your beliefs and your actions correspond with your reasons for beliefs and reasons to act. Okay, so, so the it, reasons it, it, themselves are actually predetermined in that sense. It's, it's about simply corresponding our actions to them. Or have I misunderstood you, sorry? No, so, so I would say that when it comes to rationality in that sense, um, the question is just basically whether or not you're consistently acting in, according, uh, in accordance with what reasons you have. Whereas on the truth claims of things, it's a different matter. So, so I'm trying where did your reasons come from then? 
if you're being rational, what, where did your reasons come from? So basically, you and I are born and we experience the world around us and we find that some things work and some things don't. And in that process, we discover things that we call laws. It's a bad <coughs> thing to call them, but that's what we call them. Do we discover them, though, if we had no choice? I mean, in what, in what sense do we discover anything oh, I see, if, so we, we, if we didn't have any choice in the matter? It feels like you being ultimately coming to a position where you believe it's much more likely God doesn't exist isn't something you in any way arrived at through a, a process of reason, as in looking at the different options, deciding which ones made most sense, going with that option. If you're a determinist, it was actually the chemicals in your brain and a completely determined process that goes back to the birth of the universe that means you're an atheist. And that, for me, directly contradicts the idea of reason. Well, determinism actually falls into more of a um, wider purview of that. So, for example, if quantum mechanics was to reveal that there's a quantum randomness, then it wasn't determined from the beginning. Yeah, it's random, but that doesn't make it any better. Exactly, it? exactly. Yeah. So it's still so, like so I'm it's not... the same thing. So it's so just it's... random instead of determined. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you either have random or you have determined, <laughs> neither of which give you free will or reason. Why wouldn't it give you reason? Because it's random. <laughs> no, no. The quantum part would be random. Determinism yeah. is by definition reasonable. Is it? Because how, how because so? if you can trace back in a deterministic way, then you're relying on reason to do so. But in the very act of processing, tracing back in a deterministic way, all the beliefs and thoughts you're having in that process have been predetermined. There's no reason to believe you're having true beliefs because they're simply the product of non-rational processes in your brain. That's the problem. At every level, it doesn't make sense. It completely undercuts itself, as far as I can see. That's, that's honestly, I mean, this was a big, a big, Part of my journey was reading C.S. Lewis, and if you read his book Miracles, mm -hmm. he makes this case for the argument from reason, it's called. And it was like a, a penny dropped in my mind, and I thought, wow, this makes sense. How can you believe in reason if you believe we live in an entirely naturalistic universe? It, it, se it seems to me that what you're pressing on there is the, um, is the idea that we don't know anything with certainty, or I can't, because of my worldview. Is that I, I, I'd say that's certainly a consequence of it, yes, right. but also just the fact that you can't really even believe in truth beauty, right, wrong, anything. It's all just atoms. Well, it really depends on the definition of what we use truth, for truth. If we say that something is absolutely certain, <laughs> no, I reject that. I think Immanuel Kant was right. Well, yeah. um, was that Immanuel Kant? Whoever said... Um, but even in saying on. that, even in saying yeah. I reject that, that, that's not you saying that. It's just, <laughs> so it is it's just the deterministic process that happened to lead to the point where words come out of your mouth that have those particular so, syllables. So, so the fact that an earthquake <laughs> is determined, it's still an earthquake. I know, and it's yeah. in that sense completely non-purposeful on your on your view. I would so, say so. It, it, I, I mean, it's, it, we're arguing about, I guess, where the essence lays, and that is that I, I think that you can call me an entity, and you, the fact that I'm not uh, that I'm determined by either deterministic processes <laughs> or by randomness, uh, you still you still have a me. I do, but Which I don't have one reason. with any free will or reason. That's the problem. So, so and, that's, and, it, and you're called rationality rules. Yeah. So, if anyway, you look yeah. like you want to. Do you want to just? No, you've got four minutes. Do you want to move oh. on to another topic, or you? Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, no, I thought you were bringing us to an end. No, sorry, keep okay. going. If you want well, to. I, I'm very happy to move on to another one if you want to. Absolutely, okay. go for it. Yeah, just uh, okay. Um, well, we could talk about another of the the, the issues I brought up, which is um, the um, the issue of morality, um, which in a way ties in with what we've just been talking about, because if there is no ultimate um, freedom, uh, because we're all ultimately determined. Uh, as you yourself know, I've seen you talk about this on your videos, there's no ultimate mor moral blame or praise that can be attributed to anyone. We were all bound to do the things we do. So no one's really done anything wrong. No one's really done anything right. We've just acted either according to our genes or the electrons or whatever level you want to go to. So when you come up here and say, isn't it terrible? Isn't religion a poison? Isn't it all awful? How can you even stand on that statement if there is no such thing, ultimately, as anyone doing anything right or wrong? Because we were all determined to do whatever we did anyway. Sure. So there's, so <clears throat> there's a question there with morality and a question there with free will. I don't necessarily think that they're tethered, but I understand you presented them as such. Um, when it comes to morality, we all just want to be able to say it's wrong to murder, period. And that is something that's very comforting about religious belief. You can just say, do not murder, period. Or you could say... Uh, um, uh, abortion is wrong, period. But as we saw today, uh, it turns out that you can't. Um, because still, the religious have um, moral subjectivity because they have to interpret it. 
which are God with a fixed, I might add. But when it comes to morality, so far as I'm concerned, you and I are born and we find ourselves in this world where there's certain things that we want to experience and certain things that we don't. That is something, if you will, that is written on your heart because it's in your, in your genes, it's in your DNA. And there are right and wrong ways, so far as we can tell, to achieve those things. And then we collaborate and we set up uh, societies and we set up situations in which we can pursue those goals. But if you're looking for an ultimate, an ultimate murder is wrong. No, it's not out there. Okay. So ultimate isn't, murder ultimately isn't wrong. No. It's just our personal preferences. It's not just personal preferences. Them, no? uh, it, it depends on how we use the, the definitions of these things. But what it is is that you have a compulsion straight from the outset, wired into you, where you don't want to suffer. Mm -hmm. So do I. Yeah, um, and then we make agreements to make a, a society, a system. Sure. In which well, if we, we agree on on the outcome, then yeah, we can get yeah. in a sense an objective way of doing that. But, you won't. The, the, but, the beauty is, is that you won't find many people that want okay. to be tortured all day long. No, they don't. But you might find people like Genghis Khan mm -hmm. who have the ability to torture people all day long because yes. they get a trip out of it. Yeah. And what's wrong with Genghis Khan doing that if that's just the way he's wired? It's not wrong in an ultimate sense. Okay. What is wrong about that? Um, is that it's in conflict with the uh, preferences, if you will, uh, with pretty much everyone else. Sure. So, so why so should Genghis Khan care? I no, he like shouldn't. A, okay, right. This is what makes things difficult. I feel, okay. I feel like we're mired in the religious language, per se, and so we can't actually address these issues with the sincerity that we need. So this, the problem for me, and I'm, as where we're probably getting to the end of this time, is that if you can't say Genghis Khan didn't really do anything wrong, that fundamentally goes against everything that makes us human. And so the reason Christianity is rational, why God makes sense, is because I cannot dispense with that moral view about what makes humans humans. How do you not see that as an appeal to emotion? Well, it's an appeal to our most basic fundamental instincts, in a way. But, but, but it's emotion. You're saying, I want, I want these things to be... Well, if it's emotion, instinct. that's fine, but I'd rather have that I, I emotion do. than the logic that Genghis Khan so didn't the, really do so anything the, wrong. No, the logic would be, in an ultimate sense, he did nothing wrong. He yeah, did, on, did on your worldview, yeah. absolutely. I think you're absolutely consistent on your worldview. The mm -hmm. problem is you can't live that worldview. Yeah. No it's one can live yeah. that worldview. It's just, it's just unlivable. Well, Genghis Khan might be able to live it, but I couldn't. So. <laughs> Japan seems to be doing okay. Yeah, well, if you agree with what they're doing, that's You that's can fine. take the conversation now, by the way. But <laughs> well, continue. thank you for the questions. Um, Sorry, I hope I didn't. Like, I, I'm, I, I, I'm aware of kind of being... I, I, it's a debate, Justin. Do not, do not be apologising. <laughs> I told you I'm in the lion's den. If you didn't bite me <laughs> once, I'd feel like I was left out. Okay, so first question. Do you know with certainty that God exists? No. Okay. So does that mean you're agnostic? No, it means that I have faith that God exists. Even though I have uncertainty, I trust that God is there. So where would you put your percentage on it? I personally don't like, even though I'm asked you to do it, I don't like putting percentages <laughs> on things. I'm aware that that is a massive hypocrisy, but I don't yeah. think belief in God, tr or what I would call faith or trust in God, is something you define in percentages. I think it's a really unhelpful way of doing things. I would simply say that I have a confident trust that God is there, that is not simply on the basis of the arguments I spelled out. It's for a whole range of factors. So I'd have to assume that it's actually um, very, very high, considering... The I'd say, yeah, it is high. I'd, I'd say it's high. I wouldn't say, well, though, could... that it's uh, 100%, uh, because I've got to be able to say, yeah, I could be wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I could be just a brain in a vacuum fed ideas. You know? uh, yeah, could you perhaps compare it to something that you would have equal um, knowledge of? Um, so, do you mean, is there any other beliefs I hold? That, you, like, for example, would you say that you know that God exists in the same way that you know that Australia exists? Or would you say, no, 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 it's much greater than that, or weaker? Um, I, I would say that uh, I know, I, I have, that, again, the problem is, it's not that trust or faith or belief in God is the same thing as me knowing God. The, the difference is, there's a huge difference in what that means to my life, in a way. So. It would be strange to compare it to my belief in Australia existing. Um, it's it's a different kind of belief uh, to, to to that kind of belief. If that makes sense. It sounds like there's like two different epistemologies being worked. At. Well, I think there's just different. I think the problem is that if you start to talk about Christian faith as mm -hmm. simply an epistemology in the same way that belief in Australia is is part of your epistemological makeup, then the problem is you're you're immediately putting it in this kind of thing that can basically be 
put into numbers, basically. Well, we'll, 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 well this, this is what science yeah. does. We want to understand yeah, how we make knowledge claims. To, to, have, to have one set yeah. of rules for your religion and to use a different set of rules for everything else is a form well, of as, as I was just trying to make clear in my talk, I, mm -hmm. science is great for some things, mm -hmm. but it's not great for everything. So <laughs> you're I, not, didn't, I didn't say it wasn't. I, okay. I, I do but, agree with but that. But that's what I'm saying, is, is I don't feel bound to the scientific approach when it comes to trying to explain my belief in God. I, I think it transcends a purely scientific... But if, but if it's a knowledge claim, all knowledge claims <laughs> are to do with our, with our epistemologies, and you use your epistemology to identify truth claims about everything, but when it comes to the question of God and your Christianity, you're not using it. Well, I'm, is, is I'm that, is that what you're saying you're not using it? Here's, here's how I put it then. Mm -hmm. I'd say um, I, I have a confident belief that God exists, mm -hmm. but it's not an iron cast one that is absolutely okay. indubitable. Um, there are objective reasons that give me, if you like, objective evidences for why I think it makes sense for God to exist. Sure. But if you could show me that some of those things that I talked about could be very adequately explained by a naturalistic account, I'd have less objective reasons to believe in God. Okay. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily, less, there might be other reasons, my experiential reasons and other things that, that cause me to think that actually I, I've got good reason to believe in God. Fair, well, I'll move on to the next question okay. if you're okay with that. If an omnipotent, omnibenevolent God exists, would it not necessarily follow that everyone believes in him? So this, I thought, was a really interesting part of your, your talk, um, because it's essentially kind of like the problem of evil, isn't yeah. it, really? It, but it's saying, if there is this God, why didn't he just snap his fingers and make us all believe? <laughs> well, the problem is, I think, to, to make that claim that that's the way God should have acted if he exists, is to basically put yourself in the position of God and to claim to so, know... So, so to be clear, I wouldn't say... Sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. I wouldn't say that he should or do this. I'm saying that he would have done better than this. Would have done better than this. Yeah, well, because, okay, because but you're if, still, you, if you can conceive of in something... In a sense, that you're, you're better, the one making a knowledge claim, though. You're saying... I know that if there is a God, yeah. he would have at least done better than the situation you currently see where people disagree on gay marriage and abortion and those kinds of things. Um, my point is, I, I would say, though, God's job, I don't think particularly the claim of Christianity, the rationality of Christianity is found in everyone thinking the same thing. OK, mm -hmm. uh, we have I do believe in this thing called free will, and I believe God has actually given us this free will. And because we have this free will, we will inevitably come to different conclusions because that's what free will does. It enables you to think differently. Do you people. think that's like vital to Christianity? Yeah, I do, because without so, free so, will, so, you can't have love. So where do you put Calvinists? Well, I don't disagree with them. <laughs> so, <laughs> would, you, would, you, would you call them Christians? Yeah, because they so, believe so, that so Jesus you, has died uh, and risen for them to give so them So you have a determinist like me but, that's a Christian? Yeah, I'd, I'd just that's say they're, they're wrong more. about that. Yeah, mm. I'd say we'd just have a fundamental disagreement. But that's okay, because I think Christians can disagree on doctrine. Mm -hmm. the, the, the point is, you seem to be saying, if Christians disagree on any issue, that means God doesn't exist. I just think that's crazy, because... Um, no, 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 I'm not saying that, just to be okay. clear, but, but I, I understand... Okay. Well, maybe I'm, I'm over, okay. over All I'm what, <laughs> what I would say is that uh, it's impossible for you to know, unfortunately, in your position, the kind of world in which God could actually make the best outcomes come out. Yeah. So, so in a way, uh, you would have to show me how you know yeah. that this God is not doing the best job. Because as it happens, you talked about the Bible a great deal yeah. and how... Well, all I would say is that if he was all-powerful, yeah. he would be able to make me understand. And if he was all-loving... Right, but he that would... might just contradict your free will as well. If he's all-powerful and can make his click, click his fingers, make you believe in him, yeah. where's your free will gone? It's, and the point is, I don't think God is going to sacrifice our free will which is ultimately what makes us human because it allows us to love. Uh, you can't love someone without it being freely given. And freely so I don't received. believe in free will. Would you say I can't love? I would say that it's very difficult to have a... I believe you do love, yeah. but I don't think you have a foundation for it on your worldview. So, so foundation is a different claim, perhaps, mm. and I think I do have a foundation. But I can assure you I can love. Oh, I, I believe that entirely. Yeah, and yeah, I believe I mean, you're a very moral person, <laughs> yeah. and I believe you've got how, how, lots of how, purposes. How can and, I be and, moral and, if, if I don't make my choices? Wouldn't you say well, that that's that the problem. Moral? That's why I believe your view is wrong. I believe you're a moral person. But, but I just you, believe you're thinking about it. But the thing is, that when you criticised me, you were saying that I can't make moral statements, and then you just said I'm a moral person. Well, I'm saying you can't consistently make moral statements. You make moral statements all the time, but I believe they're inconsistent with your worldview. Okay. Uh, next question, if you okay. mind. How, how long have I got? <laughs> uh, You're five more minutes. Thank you. Is God just and merciful? Yes. Uh, how? Because by definition, mercy is the suspension of justice. One can't enact justice and simultaneously suspend it. Right. Well, logically, you're absolutely right. If you just look at it logically, 
but I believe God is a God of paradoxes. And at the very centre of the Christian story is a story of a God who comes and fulfills the requirements of justice in order to show us mercy. That's the whole story of Jesus in a nutshell. So for me, Jesus is the answer to your question. It's not a logical answer is the only problem. It, it, does, problem it, does, it does feel from? like an odd answer. Okay, because... well, let me just explain then. It's not a logical answer because at the end of the day, love is not terribly logical. But I do believe that in a very interesting, mysterious and important way, Jesus fulfills all the requirements of God's justice and is the vehicle for God's mercy as well. So, so do you accept that mercy is by definition the suspension of justice? No, I, I would simply say that mercy is God showing his great love for us. Um, I don't think it means that his judgment has so, been okay, suspended. So, I think it means his judgment has been satisfied. So you'd say those interpretations would be incorrect. It'd be better to interpret it as you just, just get I would, yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, in, in, in 2 Samuel 13, 13 through 15, God kills an innocent baby to punish a father. Here's the King James Version. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by uh, this deed thou, uh, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also is born unto thee shall surely die. So in this uh, situation, uh, King David's son um, mm. was killed because God was angry with God. My question is, how is this not a contradiction of an omnipotent, omnibenevolent God? Well, the first thing I want to say before we get to that specific question is that the very tools by which you're judging this to be an immoral thing are themselves dependent on the idea that there is a morality. And we've already established that's a big problem for your worldview. So well, I'm just well, going to put no, that there. What I'd like to say is that it is you that's asserting that um, there's an objective morality. So if I'm not asserting it in that ultimate sense, it's not an issue. For okay, me. but it's just e an even, issue if, even on a subjective level, the morality you do hold is actually a result of 2000 years of Christian history. So the very <laughs> The very um, morality with which you judge this Bible passage is itself Christian morality. And there's a bit of a, a funny kind of contradiction for me in, in that. But it, it feels like you're avoiding my question. OK, I'm coming to the question now. So um, I don't claim that to fully understand all aspects of the Old Testament. And I don't think to be a rational Christian, you necessarily have to. I think there's lots of mystery and things that I won't fully understand. God is God and people are people. And to some extent, a lot of the stories like this in the Old Testament are people trying to grapple with a God who is ultimately beyond us. Now, ultimately, um, I'd have to read the actual words of the passage. I'm not sure whether it says God killed the child as a punishment, as it were, uh, for David. The child sin. suffered for several weeks while David was uh, fasting. Yeah. It doesn't say specifically there, that, as far as I can recall from the passage, that God made this child suffer for this particular and, reason. Um, there may be a way of reading that passage which doesn't actually necessarily entail that consequence. I do but, think you'd have to bend over backwards. The passage before, he gives away David's wives to someone else so that they can be essentially raped um, uh, so that David could see. So that's women being again, as property. Well, again, you've got to bear in mind that a lot of the Old Testament is not necessarily prescriptive. It's describing what happened in that culture, not all of it is. One but but the, the big point here, if I can get to it, because... A year ago, when, when Alex, who's in the audience, came and did this conversation with, with Jonathan McClatchy, they got completely derailed by all these mm -hmm. issues about slavery and warfare and so on. It's interesting, good questions. But for me, the problem is it complete, it's a complete red herring, OK? Because A, there's the morality issue. But secondly, the Bible, for me, is not meant to be understood as this sort of, well, what <coughs> basically a rule book for what I would do if I was an ancient Israelite in that culture. That's a culture that is very, very different to my own. And I, I may have great difficulty getting under it and the things that, that happen in that part. But what it is, the Bible for me, is a journey, a guidebook to the person that it reveals, Jesus Christ. And it's in him and his example and his ethical uh, <coughs> model that I then look back at the whole of the rest of that scripture. He is the lens through which I interpret all of that Old Testament stuff. The book of Hebrews says that... Um, God has spoken to us in many ways in different ways, but that ultimately he's spoken to us in one final way, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the lens through which I look at all those other partial revelations of God. And for me, you can't get a more um, moral person who has actually shaped the whole of Western morality ultimately than Jesus Christ. Yeah, I guess as a skeptic, uh, seeing a baby get killed for the sins of the father is just something- I'm not saying I'm I, I, I to... if that's the, what the passage actually is saying, and I'm not saying it is saying that, uh, then I would agree. That's a really tough thing to get your head around. It doesn't sure. stop me 
It doesn't it seems, make it, it irrational seems that to believe with, with, that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. Though. Sure, it seems that with these difficult, if I could just quickly finish, that's okay. I do have another question, but let's skip that. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that what comes to mind when I'm speaking with you is a quote from John Adams, and that is that mystery is a convenient excuse for absurdity. I just don't think that you'd be bending over like this for other discussions, but you do it for Christianity, and you somehow manage to well, try. I, I wouldn't say I'm well. bending over. I'm saying I'm trying to take a more nuanced view of Scripture. <laughs> Sometimes atheists like but, to but it's, it's like you're, you're two Christian. steps away from Jordan Peterson if you go too far. I quite like Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like Jordan Peterson. But, uh, if you believe in Jordan Peterson's God, then uh, well, this would be a whole yeah, different. Well, maybe Jordan will end up believing you like on two days. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, it was really great to listen to you, wasn't it? I'm oh, really trying. Let's give them a round of applause. Why not? So, um, Justin, over to you, you're going to do your five-minute talk. Oh, it's me, my five-minute talk. Is that right? I forgot about that, yes. So, the five-minute closing speech. Well, this was really fun, so thank you very much, and I appreciate that we kind of went for each other uh, in a way, um, Stephen, but it was was really good fun. Um, So, tonight, all I've tried to do, as I explained earlier, is to advance a cumulative case for why it is rational to be a Christian And I would say more rational to be a Christian than an atheist. I explained a number of reasons for that, uh, why God is the best explanation of human existence, best explanation of human value, best explanation of human meaning as well and uh, and reason. And I think I thought it would be fun to to use that particular argument because, of course, Stephen runs a channel called Rationality Rules. And, And I believe I have satisfactorily shown, at least to my uh, to, to my standards, that it, it, it does make sense to be a Christian. There are lots of good reasons to be a Christian. At the centre of it, of course, is not simply reasons for why we might think God exists, but actually whether this Christian story is true, that God has entered our reality to spend it with us, to die for us, and to rise again. And, and what I said I wanted to finish with is not just to talk about the intellectual arguments, but to say that actually there's an emotional component to us, that it makes sense that Christianity satisfies we aren't simply rational creatures. We are also emotional, in my view, spiritual creatures as well. And I think the West currently is living in a crisis of meaning that has essentially been brought on in, in large part by the kind of atheistic materialism that I've been talking about this evening, where beauty, love, meaning, purpose, identity, value, justice, right and wrong, free will, they're all just illusions ultimately foisted on us by a mechanical process. And that is bound to sap meaning from people's lives. No wonder we have so much of a crisis of identity and purpose and meaning in today's generation. The good news is I believe Christianity offers the solution to this. That's also why it's rational to be a Christian. Um, I love the, the book by Francis Spufford. It's called Unapologetic. Why, despite everything, Christianity makes surprising emotional sense. If you have a chance to read it, as well as obviously reading my book, do read Francis's book. But... Christianity does make sense of us emotionally because at the end of the day, the the psychologists tell us there are two things humans need to be able to live life. They need love and they need hope. And I find it very difficult to see how you have either of those things on a purely atheistic, materialistic worldview. Uh, Love is, well, if you happen to have a bit of the experience of love, well, good on you, you're one of the lucky ones, but ultimately, it is ultimately just matter in motion and Chances are most people in the world won't experience love or justice or anything like that, depending on where they land up in the heap. Equally, hope. Well, you can have your self-made purposes and hopes for the here and now, but ultimately they'll all be gone and extinguished in the ultimate heat death of the universe. But I believe Christianity holds out love and hope for us with both arms extended. Love because in the person of Jesus Christ and in his death on the cross, God showed us what the most extraordinary sacrificial kind of love looks like. I genuinely believe that, that you won't find a more extraordinary example of love, love that is available to anyone who wants it. And if you're looking for hope, then look to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because it's in his resurrection that Jesus says, this is not all there is. There is hope for you. Anyone who has been downtrodden, beaten up, downcast, has come to the end of their kind of hope. There is actually something that goes beyond this life. There is a hope that you can have eternal life. You can have ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose. And I think that's worth thinking about, investigating. Um, Our whole culture, actually, in the West, as I hinted at earlier, is based on this story. And it works. It has given us this extraordinary um, human rights and equality 
and dignity that we invest in hu humans. Again, another book recommendation, if you've got time, it's a very large one, Dominion by Tom Holland is a recent book where he as a secular historian shows how utterly indebted the whole of Western civilization is to Christianity and the way it views the individual. But it's not just because it works, I believe it works because it's true. I think there is a rational case for believing and being a Christian. It's not just a rational thing, in fact, to be a Christian. It may be the most important decision you ever make. Thank you very much. Well, the topic hasn't been tonight about atheism, but I do feel like I should uh, leave a few notes on that. An atheist is simply someone who doesn't believe in God. They don't have any, you don't have to have certain positions on free will, uh, on anything even. You can still be religious. Buddhists are, for example, they don't believe in a God, but they are atheist. So to conflate materialism and atheism, I, I do think is a mistake, but, but uh, well, we only have so much time and I've only got five more, time, uh, five more minutes of yours, so here we go. As covered throughout this conversation, rationality implies the conformity of one's beliefs with one's reasons to beliefs, and one's actions with one's reasons for action. In every endeavor of our lives, you and I rely on um, uh, every endeavor of our lives. You and I, you and I rely on evidence proportionate to the claim. If I claim that I am dyslexic, which I am, you have to exercise your epistemology. You will, you will assign a likelihood to my claim, and if in the past you found me to be trustworthy you would be inclined to accept my assertion. However, if I had the gall to claim to you that I am God incarnate, the fact that I am trustworthy would be nowhere near enough to convince you. You would, ne you would necessitate extraordinary evidence for my quite frankly absurd claim, and rightfully so. Now imagine that I was a talented magician, which I certainly am not, an illusionist such as James Randi or Darren Brown, and I uh, shocked you all with feats of what appears to be superpowers which is exactly what illusionists look like to ignorant crowds. Would you then believe that I am God incarnate? No. Okay, well, let's say that 12 of you, say you find people here, uh, you were to write this down, and you were to write down your personal testimonies dealing with my performance, detailing my performance, uh, but of course some of you have managed to get contradictions. Would, you, uh, would, in the year 4019, people then be justified in believing that I am God incarnate? No. Well, fine. Let's say that your accounts were translated, copied, amended, and then translated, copied, and amended again. Would the citizens of the future then be justified in believing me a god? No. Fine. What if I made claims about the, cosmo, uh, about the cosmos that seem true, only to be shown uh, in thousands of years not to be? If the citizens of the fifth millennia then began interpreting my words as allegory and metaphor rather than literal, would you then be justified in believing me to be God incarnate? No. In my opening speech, I mentioned that the final nail on the cross for Christianity, uh, I mentioned the final nail on the cross for Christianity, but it takes two to hold even a fictional character, and so here's the other. So far as most Christians are concerned, um, if Jesus was born of a virgin and rose from the dead, he must therefore be the son of God. So logistically, this is premise one, Jesus was born of a virgin. Premise two, Jesus rose from the dead. Conclusion. Therefore, Jesus is the Son of God. And uh, every once in a while, such as Numbers 31, verses 17 through 18, this God wants us to commit a genocide in which we slaughter every man, little boy, and every woman who have not known a man by lying with him, but to keep for ourselves the little, one, the little girls who have not known a man by lying with him. But here's the thing. Even if we grant the extraordinary claim that Jesus was born of a virgin, which we don't have sufficient reason to do, and we were to grant the extraordinary claim that Jesus resurrected, which we don't have sufficient reason to do, the conclusion of Jesus being the Son of God does not follow. This, I would argue, is the greatest non sequitur to have ever plagued humanity. Christians do not accept such illogical, irrational, absurd conclusions outside of their faith, and this sends a clear message, which I think we have seen today. One epistemology for Christianity and one epistemology for everything else. This is precisely why Christians, uh, debating with Christians has been characterised as playing chess with a pigeon. It doesn't ma matter how good you are at chess, the pigeon will knock over the pieces, take a dump on the board and strut around as if they won. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, Justin. <laughs> to be clear, thank you. 
where you're, you're forced to. <laughs> to be clear, according to some definitions of rationality, Christianity is rational. But the same definition makes almost all other religions rational. To wield such a definition is to win the, win the battle, but at the cost of the war. It's akin to saying, if Christianity is true, then Christianity is rational. This can be do done with any faith. If Hinduism uh, is true, then it's rational to be uh, a Hindu. Except this isn't actually how rationality works. Rationality means one's beliefs corresponding with one's reasons to believe. And unless we are privy to adequate reason, our beliefs are not justified, even if the belief is true. In conclusion, Christians are not necessarily irrational, plenty of which are incredibly intelligent. I'm, I'm not so naive to think this. But Christianity most certainly is not. It is completely irrational. Thank you for your time. I uh, very much enjoyed it. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you. If you listen to Unbelievable with Justin Briley on Premier Christian Radio and enjoy the conversations between Christians and skeptics, then this is the perfect app for you. For the latest updates, podcasts, videos, articles, bonus content and much more, download the Premier Unbelievable app today. enjoyed the conversation very much i'm sure you guys have i'm sure there's so many loose ends that you guys have got in your minds that haven't been tied up from the conversation that we've had tonight and um, things that have been mentioned either the opening statements closing ones or during the debate and um, we're going to go for some questions now um, if you raise your hand if you have any questions that'd be fantastic um rather if we didn't have any monologues but just direct questions if you want to direct it at one of the speakers that'd be great or i direct it at both speakers First of all, say that um, the, the main claim, before assessing the actual reliability of the scriptures as we've received them, the main claim that God did a really bad job in, uh, if that was his best way of explaining his message to us, I don't really buy that because actually Christianity has been pretty successful in the world. So it could be argued actually that book with all the errors you think it has, has actually done a pretty good job of spreading that message remarkably, almost miraculously in some ways. So I would tell say that, that to Hinduism. Sorry, tell that to Hinduism. Well, sure. I'm not saying it's spread it everywhere, yeah. but um, I'm saying that given how incredibly illogical and <coughs> ridiculous it is, it seems to have had a pretty big impact nonetheless. So, so that that's my first point. The second thing I'd say is that um, again, I feel like you're putting yourself in the position of knowing what God should have done with the Bible. <laughs> in order to fulfill his purposes. I don't think you're in a position to do that, though. I don't think you can know. Would you like me to explain? Well, well can I just first of all finish the point, which is simply that, as a Western 21st century atheist, you find yourself in a very narrow band of history in which you need, a, for your purposes, you need this much evidence in order for you to be convinced that there's a God and Christianity is true. As it happens, the Bible has provided that evidence for people down millennia uh, so people in all kinds of different situations and all over the world today for whom it's a very good way of them. So it may be that God's purposes aren't specifically directed at Stephen right now, having his particular burden of evidence met. It might be that God has purposes far wider than that, whereby actually the way we have received the scriptures is a really good way, actually. But coming finally to the point of whether these are really badly transmitted, I just think that's plain wrong. I think a lot of what you've depicted there is a straw man of what the Gospels are and the Bible is. We have an extraordinarily accurate um, idea of the transmission of the text because we have this tool, this scientific tool really, called textual criticism. So and I've had some of the leading people on both sides. Uh, and so it sounded, I hate to say it, like you were even saying Jesus is fictional on your view. Um, so, <clears throat> as far as whether or not I'm convinced on Jesus' existence, um, I wouldn't say any more so than may, uh, ma many other historical figures. Okay, well, but, um, fair enough, if that's the, where the evidence has taken you. All I would say is that you're going against the vast majority of historians, Christian, non-Christian, for whom this is simply not an issue. The, I mean, I had Bart Ehrman... There, there, there would also be, what do we mean by Jesus? Do we mean that a man sure. existed for okay. Jesus? Well, yeah, I think that's uh, okay, probable, fair enough. That a man but, that but all I'm person. saying is you painted it to look like We've got absolutely no idea what happened in first century Israel. We actually have a pretty good idea. We have these documents which are actually written down extremely close to the time of the events compared to any other similar historical genre of writing of that period. Uh, we have 
lots of indications within those writings that they go back to eyewitness testimony. We had them Paul, the kind of stuff that is absolute gold dust for historians in terms of how close his letters are to the events of Christianity. And what he quotes in these letters, things like 1 Corinthians 15, the tradition about Jesus, goes right back to within a year or two of Jesus's life and the alleged death and resurrection. So the claim that this is somehow just, you know, you know, Chinese whispers and it's just all kind of like we can never know. That's just not true. There's a, there's a science which has shown us just how close we are and accurate we are to those times. Perhaps if I can be terse in a reply, that would be, yeah. that would be useful. <clears throat> the issue is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary, extraordinary evidence and an all-powerful God would know that. He, <laughs> to establish super, uh, supernatural uh, assertions through historical accounts, it's not done at all because it's not workable, it's not rational. But here it's done. Well, in, I, I in would just day. challenge that claim that, su that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I, if I win the lottery, that's an extraordinary claim, right? But all the evidence I need is a lottery ticket to show you. So yeah. in what sense is that? Because win winning, winning the lottery doesn't require a violation of all the laws, <laughs> you know? I know, but... I, the resurrection does. Uh, well, it requires there being a God who could potentially feed new laws into the system he created. I believe I made a case for that God. And that then the best case for what happened around those stories of the resurrection are what the disciples claimed had happened. Could reply, but I... Yeah, well, exactly. I like, we'll answer yeah. question. Um, well, all I would say in response to that is that I think that we don't have to all agree on what the morality is for there to be an objective case, for there to be an objective morality. I'd also add that I'm not sure which passages you might be referring to, but I don't think the Bible at any point God justifies the torture of animals. So the passage has... I'm thinking about there is um, when George, uh, God commands the uh, armies conquering Canaanite, he says, hoff the horses. And what that means is to sever their Achilles tendons. Right. And that is clearly a torture. And God could have just immobilised the horses yeah. without doing that. That's well, the I'd, I'd have to look at that passage. I, I would uh, just add to that, that um, animals were created for Adam and Eve. I, that's at least the interpretation that I would get. So in which case, they're for him. Well, I would, I would say, I'll try and respond to both of these, these um, questions, but I'd say I'd have to look at that passage more carefully. I'm not immediately familiar with that one. So... Again, uh, I, I appreciate that's not a great answer. Um, I, I'd say that what we get in the creation story is that um, Adam and Eve, humans, if you like, are given the stewardship of the rest of creation. And that absolutely means taking care of and not mistreating the creation. But to come back to your central question, because we got a bit sidetracked there, <clears throat> um, uh, you might be right. You might be right that veganism is the morally objective case. I don't know. Okay, there are some things where we don't know. That's kind of for me a live issue. Okay, as to what it is, uh, and then I would have to look at whether the Bible does or doesn't comport with that. the The big issue for me is that I'm I'm not going to the Bible to just read off a list of commandments. Oh, and that's my morality. Okay, I'm an intelligent reader of the Bible. Is through, I would say, the witness of the Holy Spirit, is trying to live the most moral life they can in the light of Jesus Christ, who sheds light on those scriptures, okay? For me, the reason I do believe there is an objective morality is in a sense, yeah, it is an intuition. I feel like there is um, racism that's wrong, okay? And I can't imagine anyone convincing me differently from that. And I think the people who used to think it's not wrong, back in, say, the 19th or 18th century or whatever, well, they, they were wrong. They were, they were absolutely, they were wrong about There's a matter of fact that racism is wrong, okay? So as far as I'm concerned, that looks like a moral fact, an objective fact about reality. And the only point I'm making is that if you share that view, if you share that view that that actually is an objective fact about reality, racism is wrong, you've got to be able to justify it. The only way you can justify that is if there is a transcendent moral <coughs> realm, if you like, beyond this purely physical realm. And so for that, for me, is why. Um, now, you can then do Bible study, and that's an interesting project, but I'm not going to the Bible, necessarily, to, to say, I'm just going to read all morality off that. I'm going to use it as a student of the Bible and my own sense of what is moral, and, yeah, and the Holy Spirit. Thanks.
I didn't actually try to present the argument in terms of probabilities. Uh, the one part in um, 10 to the 60 is, is more a, it's not so much a probability as it is a tolerance level, if you like. It's that, that's the tolerance within which it has to fall. Now, I, I will admit it's hard to map that onto a probability exactly. And I did a video, which some of you might be familiar with, where I, I kind of used the probability of throwing 76s in a row. And I think a valid way of critiquing that video is there's a difference between that kind of probability and the tolerance level of a fine-tuned constant. Nonetheless, I don't think that takes away from the fact that this is a remarkably fine-tuned level <coughs> which has to be established for life to exist. And so there's, there's something really weird going on there, even if we don't uh, assign it probabilities in the, in the way we normally would. If I could just add just a yeah. small point on that, and that is that you said about the video that you made, yeah. and um, there was a good response, I think it was from Alex O'Connor. But if you was to roll 10 um, um, uh, six-sided dice, and all of them was to get six, there's a set probability of what that would be. And people look at that and they arbitrarily say, that's rare. Mm. But it's no more rare than one, three, six, five, four, all the rest of it, if you're doing it by correspondence like that. Yeah, I think that isn't the gentleman's well, main I, point. I, I think that I, is a point. I, I, yeah. I think that's a different point to what he's making. But yeah. I, I do think I can answer that one, um, which is I just think that misrepresents the argument from fine tuning, because uh, the point is there's only one set of roles that gives you life. <laughs> yeah, of course, how every you, set of roles is just how, as. No, how do you know that? That's an extraordinary well, claim. Because you don't get chemistry to start with. You just get a completely sterile universe in the vast, vast, vast majority of combinations of the constants. So you haven't got the chemistry to begin with. So is that you're saying that all life must be carbon, there can't be silicon? Well, because it's rolled until, in a until way for that. you give me an example of a non-carbon based form of yeah. life, then... then so I'm not yeah. asserting that that's the case, but when you assert that this is the answer and there's no others, do you well, not see fallacious thinking? If, if someone's going to give me a, a third option, I'm, be my guest, okay. But at the moment, all we've got is randomness, uh, like chance, or design, as far as I can see. Or, or and, evolution. No, because evolution doesn't, that's nothing to do with the cosmic fine tuning. <laughs> it is when it comes to life, because you get, you get complex organisms that are selected for. Well, first of all, you have to have a complex organism before the evolution can start. You have to have the DNA Single cell molecule. Yeah, okay. Right, so, so there's Not that little that issue. But... Well, it's very it's still complex. complex. It's incredibly yeah. complex. Um, <laughs> we, we could go again, yeah. but should we but, move but on? But yeah. the point is, evolution has nothing to do with it, because this is actually just getting the chemistry to potentially have evolution in the future. Okay. It's nothing to do with evolution. Well, I, I'm not <coughs> saying that if you'd never heard of Christianity, it's rational to be a Christian. Obviously, I'm not saying that. Um, I'm just saying that given if we are presented with the facts of Christianity, the evidence for the resurrection, the evidence that I believe there is there for a God, it's rational to believe it, for it to follow that evidence and believe. Now, of course, there are many people in the world who have existed without those kinds of evidences. And uh, I, I would say, well, that, that it just is the way it is. It doesn't stop Christianity being rational though, uh, just in and of itself. Um, the question of, if, if the actual question you're asking is why would a God, the God of Christianity allow lots of people to have existed before and in other parts of the world without knowing about Christianity. I think that's a slightly different question. And it's one which I'm happy to leave in God's hands because I believe in a, a perfectly just God. But I believe now that <coughs> to those who are presented with the evidence and the story of Christianity, it is the most rational option to choose. So, uh, and for context, for those who haven't seen it, Alex and I had quite a long discussion about this on his podcast uh, a little while back, and uh, it was great fun as well. Um, so I've had a chance to think about this objection you put to me at that time, and I think it's a really good, interesting way of, of, of coming back at the problem. Um, what I would say is that I still ultimately feel like there is a, a sense in which you have to have freedom to choose between different alternatives. And although I, when the penny drops, as you say, uh, there's a sense in which, of course, it's that way, and that you could cast that as you didn't have a choice but to believe once the reasoning took over. I think it's just that I, I, my mind quickly travelled and said, yes, that's the one that has that makes the most sense. I don't think it means that I'm the other options are unavailable to me anymore. It's just that, that I've chosen to attend and to see that that is the one with the most evidence. 
But I think another thing, and this was helpful, someone came back to me after our discussion and, and suggested this. You may not have to introduce the free will issue at all, okay? You, for, for, to, in a sense, the other, the other side, of court, side of that coin, that, that argument from reason, is simply that, is it the case that our beliefs about what's true and false are in fact reducible to chemical reactions in our brain? Okay, that's kind of another way of expressing the, the, the argument. And, and my view is simply that, if that's the way we arrive at our beliefs, if that's the actual process of reasoning, the chemical concentrations of atoms and electrons in your brain, it fun, as I was saying earlier, it undercuts the whole process because I can't see how that itself is a reasonable process. That's just a purely undetermined, uh, uh, mechanical, <coughs> non-purposive, non-rational process. And how on earth you get from that to reason is takes a bit of faith, in my view. Can you tell we're at Oxford University? I can. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. I went to Southampton, so this is a big, big sight matter. <laughs> oh, poor people in Southampton. Listen, Come listen, on. they won't care. They're too tough. <laughs> uh, it seemed like what, what you were saying, correct me if I'm wrong, was you were talking about the relationship between knowing truth and survivability for evolution. Um, my view is quite similar to the great Richard Dawkins, and that is that we did not evolve to be rational, and that's why we struggle with this quite greatly. So essentially, if, if there's a bush, I'm going to use you again, Justin, sorry, but you're not the bush, don't worry. Okay. If there was a bush, and um, me, and, me and Justin were cavemen, and there was a rustle, the logical thing to do is to assume that it was wind, or a very small creature, um, and not look, keep your attention elsewhere. <coughs> the irrational thing would be to assume it's a lion that's going to get me. And so Justin may look, and I, and I won't, and then I'll have a little giggle at his expense going, it's not a lion. This will happen again and again and again, but all it takes is one time of it being the lion. Justin will look and go, whoa, it is a lion, and they'll step back, and then I'm out of the pool. I'm done. And if it pulls me out before I can reproduce, it means that irrationality is selected to go forward, and that is the case of what we have here. I, I, think, I think irrationality is, uh, is a very uh, viable evolution, uh, evolutionary uh, way, to, way to go, and I think it has been chosen to a large extent. I mean, what interests me about that response is you're effectively making the case for him then that we can't really trust our evolved beliefs because they're primarily directed at survival sure. rather than true beliefs. And that's the problem that, that Alvin Plantinga points yeah. out that yeah. that undercuts naturalism itself because if we're evolved to essentially um, for survival beliefs rather than true beliefs, uh, like the one you mentioned, um, then how can we trust this process that gave us these beliefs because it, it reminds, it's, it's it, undercut again <clears throat> in the same way that I was saying earlier. Well, it reminds me very much of uh, when Christopher Hitchens was asked if he believed in free will and his answer was, I have no choice. <laughs> what that means is that we don't have a choice but to play this game, Justin. We've evolved and this is how we deal with the world. We have a certain apparatus to use. We can verify our claims. The fact that it's not comfortable to be able to say we don't know with certainty does not give us excuse to say this worldview would and likes more appealing to me. What worries me is um, with a lot of what you said today is that it's the two quo qui fallacy and it's essentially that I can't answer this but atheism can't either. This is, well, this I, is the I, bypass I, well, the issue. I, I think the, the, what the, I was, I was just, I was just sorry, gonna say, go sorry, I was just gonna say, but with this, with the fact that we can't ascertain knowledge in this, in this wonderful sense that we all want to, it's not a problem on my worldview, but it is on yours. Uh, oh, I, I would differ. I would say it's a massive problem because of the reason I was saying it massively undercuts the whole idea of reason to start with. But the reason it isn't a problem, in my view, is because that sense that, yeah, of course we need to rely on reason. Of course we need to develop true beliefs. That's perfectly possible in a theistic worldview. So it, it coheres a lot better with our sense of what makes sense to us. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to tie it up there. But thank you so much, both of you, again, for your um, wonderful insights. Let's give them a round of applause. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.